that gene is just going to be made. It doesn't know where the gene came from. And if we can kind of mimic that, there's nothing that says that it won't just work. We talked about this a little bit as well. Viruses are the common enemy of bacteria. And the thing that they will do, just like they do to us in some cases, is they are going to insert that genetic material. That material will be made into more viral genes, and you're going to make more baby viruses, and they're going to swarm everything, kill all the bacteria in the area. Now, not every bacteria is dead. They obviously had some sort of defense against this. So I want you to meet that first defense. This is a restriction enzyme. This is something found in bacteria. What this enzyme does, so you've seen enzymes in intro where it's like they go, they find their target, they chew it up, and they leave, right? This enzyme's target is DNA. But specifically, it's a specific sequence of DNA, very exact. What this enzyme is going to do is cut right there. And this is going to chew up a pretty well known viral predator sequence of this bacteria. It's going to slice it just like that. Because remember, the way the virus infects is sends in genetic material. So, what better tool? to prevent that material from coming in than to just cut it up before it can actually start making baby viruses. And specifically, the way that these evolved, they always evolved to cut a specific sequence of a specific virus that hunted that bacteria, right? So remember, there's billions of bacteria in a single area. And even if they're bathed in viruses, maybe one of these bacteria has a cutting enzyme of some kind and it happened to slice right at the right spot to kill the virus. But specifically, these are such specific sequences, they are not found in the bacteria genome because if this enzyme was running around, the bacteria would get its own genome diced up, right? These are purely, that's why they had to be so specific. So virus comes in, it's cut. That's how a lot of these bacteria survive. Now, you'll see the word bioengineering all the time and think that we, you know, like invented something. No, most bioengineering is that we steal stuff. There's me, I'm saying, let's use the ring, hooray. Most bioengineering is gonna be, we're just gonna take this thing that bacteria evolved and put it to use. We actually didn't make, we don't make quite a bit of tools. Now, somebody at the U of Wisconsin saw this as an opportunity. This wasn't biology, this was engineering. If you can cut DNA at a specific spot, can't you cut one piece of DNA, a second piece of DNA, and then slap them together? If you see these more as like physics and something that you can actually like parts that you can build something from. This was a very aggressive first step into this realm. Now remember, we know what DNA is at this point. This is about in the 70s, 80s. What she did to prove this, where she took something, a virus called SV40, it's a harmless virus, but we know that it replicates, behaves virally, right? She took that, she, she digested it on these ends right here with those restriction enzymes. Then she took a bacterial plasmid called DVGAL. Remember, plasmids are little bacterial sets of genes. She took this and she digested these ends. And remember, kind of like we saw up here, see how these ends want to stick to something? So you digest both sides, put them together, and you create a hybrid, bacteria and a virus in one, at least genetically. And the cool thing is, is with all this bioengineering and all this stuff, we didn't have to invent the tools to seal everything up. We didn't have to invent the tools to allow this to add more nucleotides or replicate itself. We just plopped this in a cell and the cells polymerase started making more of these. DNA ligase is going to seal these gaps just like it does with us. And everything moves on as though nothing happened. Life specifically really adaptable microorganisms like these are good because they're so solid and uniform. 
But what Dr. Mertz showed is that they can be basically repurposed. Now, this, uh, this didn't exactly sit well with everybody, I wouldn't say, because now what's the limit as far as what's possible to split, to combine, to hybridize? Oops, maybe one more. Sorry, Cora. This area. Oops, wait. So the instructions on the board there, this is the beginning and this is the basic idea of engineering. We take a just small circular a la carte plasmid of DNA. Remember these things are only like eh, 4,000 base pairs, pretty small. We use those restriction enzymes to make sticky ends and chop our target DNA right here and here. We do the same thing down here and here and these ends will suddenly join one another. You will be able to insert a gene into a plasmid. And suddenly that gene is going to get made in the bacteria all of a sudden. Bacteria doesn't know what it is, it's just going to make it. Now, fun quote as this started to happen. And maybe you can disagree with this because we are seeing, remember I talked about the bite, the atom, and the gene. You can predict the future with the gene. You can control the present with the atom. And I'd say the future on the bite is still up in the air. Now, making a new form of life, this is the first thing what Janet Mertz did. That was the first time that it happened. What the fly guys had done, remember, they mutated stuff, and they did make a unique fly technically with that. But it was not from something completely different. So this is that simple, basically. If you can insert a gene from another species and put it in a plasmid bacteria, the bacteria will multiply. And they will in mass make this gene for you. So this replication right here, binary fission, very quick. And remember, they're all the same. You're not gonna have any variation with this gene. Just clones on clones forever. So one problem here is that when you insert a plasmid, you got to understand which ones actually have it. So when you give a plasmid to bacteria and you just show up and say like, okay, here's, you know, here's this plasmid that we engineered. You kind of try, there are ways we'll see you try and introduce that to the bacteria. Not all of them will take it though. One of the problems when we first started doing this is that Dr. Mertz saw that there were ways, there were some bacteria that were expressing her gene that she wanted and making it and others that weren't. So she added another engineering step. You have your desired gene on the left right there. But what we started doing was using plasmids that had antibiotic resistance genes, just a small one. So what's going to happen here is that this marker gene, as we call it, and usually it's going to be an antibiotic resistance one. There's a couple others. We can say, okay, only bacteria that have that antibiotic gene are going to be growing on this media that we have laced with antibiotic. So there's tons of antibiotic in this media. Only the bacteria that survive are the ones that have the plasmid because the plasmid carries the resistance for them. The plasmid is also engineered to carry our gene with it. So this way, we only get the survivors and the survivors are the ones with the plasmid. That's the, big, that's the biggest way to select for something. When I ask on the exam, is selection means necessary for engineering? That's definitely one of the right answers. When I ask the question, what is not an ingredient you need to do a genetic engineering basic? You do need a selection mechanism. Now, you can have other markers too. For example, there's something called uh, GFP, green fluorescent protein. Um, it just lights up green. And so you can see which bacteria have the green and then those are your colonies, for example. The antibiotic one's a little cleaner because it just kills off your ones that don't have it.
Sweet. So at this point, who, yeah, who, who finds that actually a lot simpler than you thought it might be to say genetic engineering, right? It's usually the feeling that I get too. So the thing is with a living thing though, everybody got really scared that this became possible. Now the letter below, it's just kind of an allegory, but it's Einstein's letter in 1938 to Roosevelt saying, hey, the immense power of what we're doing with atoms right now, it's easily going to get turned into a weapon. Watch out. And you saw where that race ended, and maybe it was always going to end that way. And we're still sort of living in that experiment right now. And the experiment being if, that if the experiment fails, everything goes down, right? That's what Einstein was warning about. Now, with how easy this is, are these things possible? Small little harmless E. coli, but suddenly they have the spike protein of a herpes virus. Suddenly they're able to, you can engineer some sort of toxin to be produced all the time. Not too hard. Okay. 1984 is the first time that one of these major scientific meetings came through and everybody started saying, should we keep doing this? Or should we stop this right now? Now think about all the benefits we have today of genetic engineering, but also in, consider the dangers as well. And also consider if you say, and this is what I want you to write, kind of your reaction, should you be able to make things like this? Because if you say you can't, if there should be a limit, then anything can be limited. But if nothing's limited, then everything's permitted, right? So. Go ahead and a little scrap. Tell me what you think. You can apply this to engineering plasmids or more contemporary, you can apply this to how we're using CRISPR today, even if it is sort of a broad strokes picture of CRISPR you're thinking of. How much can we change life and like still be responsible for it? And equally, kind of like Tuesday's little mini writing, don't just put, I don't like it. Say why you feel the way you do. It takes nations to build an atomic bomb. Probably takes a garage and some Amazon orders to build a plasmid with something in it. Not saying it's always going to work. But engineering bacteria is one of the quicker things we can do. There's no technical law against buying a bunch of that stuff and just going after it, right? And remember, please put your name on this thing too. Because <laughs> then those have to just like go away. I don't know who it is. So we're still sort of having that issue today of should truth, quote unquote, be totally uninhibited, or are there laws of humanity that we shouldn't ever cross? And like Nuremberg, where we did decide there were laws of humanity, objective ones, to this day, we haven't really defined that in biology.
Okay. Now, <clears throat> as far as uh, as far as COVID being engineered in the lab, quote unquote, I'm not going to elaborate on that. I don't uh, I don't have the information to sadly. So maybe someday we will, but I'm not going to I'm not going to speculate or say that it's in you know either way. It's a little that's still a little bit hot of a topic right now. Okay, so how do we get plasmids in there? This is some of the strict ways that we can actually accomplish that. Number one, something called transformation. Plasmids in the environment, let's say just liquid, we kind of like heat things up and the bacteria just eat the plasmid. This is the typical, some, one of the easier ways to get that, get that to happen. And remember, the bacteria has its own little regular genome there. Plasmid is just our little a la carte single thing. That's transformation. So this is basically, I'd call this like from environment. And we can obviously plop these two things quite close to one another and that facilitates this quite well, but. So next one, familiar friend, we can put a gene in a virus and actually just send that in. This one's actually kind of unique because it actually doesn't need a plasmid. You typically engineer the virus with a plasmid, but then it just spits up its DNA into the bacteria instead. Because remember, viruses are basically just little DNA parasites. They will send in their information. And often we can engineer viruses to work for us. We even do this with HIV of all things in the lab. Typically it's a harmless version, but still. Okay, so we can feed them plasmids. We can, give, we can give them a virus that has the DNA we want. Equally, once bacteria have the plasmid, they can share it with their neighbors physically. This is called conjugation. I'll say from neighbor. Those are the three quote unquote natural ways to get it done. The quote unquote unnatural way is something called transfection, where we sort of boost its chance by shocking it. That opens up the cell membrane and the plasma is a little, plasma is a little easier in invited, basically. Technically, electric shocks don't occur naturally in nature very, very commonly. So this is something we often do from the lab. Okay. So now the good thing is like, remember, and before we get too excited about, you know, genetically engineering humans, remember we're made of 10 trillion cells. You can't just give a human a plasmid and we'll all get the bacteria. The reason we do this in single cells is that they're a single unit of life, put some DNA in, done, we just move on. We will in the final phase of the class talk about humans and what we can do. But there are certain limits and certain things we haven't conquered yet that with bacteria, it's a lot easier. So, array, and they can just share. Nice, okay. This is just conjugation, just a quicker look. Um, basically that, and this is again why in the environment, it's so difficult to stop antibiotic resistance because even if you clean a hospital room out but the one cell's left with that plasmid, it doesn't necessarily mean that all children of that cell will be bad, but they will find and donate their genes, their plasmids to all their neighbors. And then those neighbors will donate it. And you can see how this is actually going to spread a lot faster than just cells becoming more. And equally, this is something that is not possible in eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells do not ever exchange anything. And again, this is, what, this is what makes the argument very easy. The bacteria will likely be the last standing living thing on the planet when, you know, everything goes down, supposedly. I don't mean nuclear war by that. I just mean like life eventually like going away. It's okay. All right, so let's do a quick walkthrough. 
we'll see how engineering can work very quickly, very efficiently. So let's say that somebody who is recessive for something, or let's say there's a condition where a human cannot produce a certain gene, and thus they have a condition all of a sudden. We can mass produce this gene and serve it up as a like supplement or a drug, as you would call it, to this person to help their condition. So first piece, we get DNA of the actual gene. Recombinant means that it has been cut by that restriction enzyme. Okay. So once we have our DNA, excellent. Let's go over here. Here's our human DNA. Here's just a nice plasmid that we have. Now remember, we have a lot of plasmids that we've like taken from bacteria and they kind of work for us. They have genes that will cause them to replicate and just basically sustain, uh, sustain themselves. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna clip and cut with restriction enzymes right here, right here, right here, and here. Remember those like sticky ends that we're making before? So if we make these sticky ends in the plasmid and on our gene of interest, eventually we should have a pretty successful annealing right here. We'll kind of get this sealed up. And now the plasmid is, you know, something like, you know, version 2.0, let's say, because now it's got the gene we want. So, sweet. Now we have basically a little chemical factory that can make this gene. Next piece, you have the plasmid just in the tube with DNA. Now you just got to introduce this to the bacteria, feed it up. This plasmid is going to go into just a working bacteria. Typically, we can use something simple and fairly harmless like E. coli. It just grows really fast and just kind of does, it, does its thing. It doesn't produce any toxins or any weird stuff. So we're going to insert our human gene X into recombinant bacteria. Next, what we do is we make a lot of bacteria. Any of you get a glimpse of some of like the liquid yeast we had like in little flasks, right? Like there's like billions of yeast in there. Now imagine a vat, like half the size of the front right here, just swirling bacteria, like quadrillions, maybe even more of organisms, right? And they are all pumping out this plasmid gene because they don't know any better. They don't care. The plasmid says, here's this gene, make it, and they just go. From this point, we take all the bacteria, we mash them up, we harvest the gene. And the way that we can do this, you don't have to know for this part, but we basically have like tools in chemistry that can just pull this specific gene away for us. So we harvest everything up. We purify that and call it medicine. Who has a pretty good idea of what this example was? You don't have to say anything. Close, yeah. Insulin is a human gene. The process you just saw is how we make insulin. The way we used to have to make insulin was we'd have to harvest it from pigs and chemically change it quite a bit to make it safe for, for humans. Anybody know how much the insulin industry is worth in the United States? It's, it's a heavy duty number, sadly. All for this, all for a few steps. And realistically, I've always wanted to try this, maybe someday. This is easily something we could do in lab someday for fun, right? See, this is how I'll break bad finally. This is how I can do it. This is how we can do it. We could just make vats and vats of human insulin because each one of us has an insulin gene. We would take one of those, clip it with restriction enzymes, put it in a plasmid, put it in E. coli, grow tons of it, and then harvest it. Thanks. I would have to ask the biochem faculty for that help because that's the step I'll lose it. But now, sadly, what's going to happen here is that Eli Lilly and the other two, they're going to sue me and say that I'm taking their product. Now, you typically can't sue over a law of nature. Problem is, and we'll kind of see some details here, is that the insulin that is marketed as like some dumb drug name, like 
extra crapanib, blah, blah, blah. They've added kind of useless little phosphate groups to things and called it new. It's complex and I can share one of the videos from Vincent Rajkumar, he's a doctor at Mayo, does multiple myeloma stuff. He does a very good job at the Mayo seminar kind of articulating the steps that are missing in that process to get something as easy as this a lot more accessible. But it's a complex story that I'm not gonna oversimplify. So I think we are, yeah, I think we're in a good spot for a break. So go ahead and chill for a bit. Oh yeah, and pass me those things. All right, so um, on the BRCA or like mass screening response too, this is, we're, we're not starting yet, but um, remember, if you say that you have the issues with privacy with DNA, tell me why. How's somebody gonna use that information against you really, realistically, right? You can, it is possible. I'm just saying, say why in a writing every time. Equally, some, some people put their, that their, it would be overpopulation because too many lives would be saved and that hospital jobs would go bad or something. I was like, no, no, that's the goal. So I was like, ah, maybe, they missed, maybe I misconstrued the question when I, when I had it. All right. Um, oh, also, on spring break, I'll be like somewhat unavailable, so don't email me because it'll be a long time before I get it. I'm not telling you where I'm going. It's not a beach. It's not going to be fun. Don't worry. 
Besides, I hate the beach. Who actually goes to the beach? It's like, this is fun. Got sand everywhere. It's just awful. Uh, hell no. You can't swim. <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> terrifying each wave is coming to get me each time just one <laughs> one slip and i'll just get ripped tighted away sorry is that why you like no that's just because i have a cold heart yeah oh. are you, are you not an no i love the outside i just like when it's cold <laughs> sorry i don't know what's wrong with me yeah okay all right enough distractions genetic code is universal behold the glow in the dark firefly gene tobacco plant. Smoking this would not have any difference, sadly, but it looks cool and it shows that we can do this. Remember all the glow-in-the-dark animals you ever seen? Yeah, it's totally easy to pop a gene into something and it'll just happen. Now remember too, this is very different than CRISPR. CRISPR is about changing a sequence. Plasmids are about, here's a whole new thing. That's the key difference between the two. And that's mainly a final third of the class type of question, but it'll always come up on the exam on the final final. Now, like we said, we can use this in medicine. We can manipulate and change this with CRISPR a little bit. And like I said at the beginning, genetic codes universal across bacteria, across plants, across humans, everything. The human gene is not incredibly sacred. You can put a human gene in bacteria just like we did with insulin, it makes a bunch of insulin for us. Because every time, the combos will always give the amino acids that make the actual protein. Remember, proteins do stuff. They're the thing. So to practice this, and I did this at the review a little bit, just set yourself up with this because you'll always ha you'll have one of these on the test. So don't use any time on your note card to write this out or anything. I'll post one of these. And it's, I think it's the same one that's posted on the, the practice guide right now. But get good at like basically saying like, okay, U, G, U, like G, A, C, O, C, yeah. And seeing triplicates and saying, okay, which do those code for, for example. Now remember, you're going from DNA to RNA, so the U is exchanged for a T. That's just an RNA rule. Uracil is there instead of thymine. That's it. That's the only change. Okay. Oh, feel pretty good. Sweet. Okay. So still on insulin a little bit to avoid, sorry, to avoid any patents because patent law, you can't actually patent a law of nature. What they did was they actually sequenced it backwards and said, we've got this. Now these two actually didn't patent it. They did patent the process for making it though. So I introduced you guys to a lot of this law stuff. Right now the patent for CRISPR is a mega European Union versus United States battle, for example, because CRISPR is technically a law of nature, kind of like restriction enzymes. And they avoided it because they didn't take it from a cell strictly. They didn't take it from somebody's DNA. The insulin we know today has been just basically made synthetically from synthetic backwards made DNA. Still the same order, same information. So it kind of gets, kind of gets funky. Another really important one, remember hemophilia, right? Can't stop the bleeding. This is a big one. You don't hear about this the same way as insulin because there's more diabetics than there are hemophilia people. But hemophilia is a very scary one because remember, even if you like kind of get bumped in the car a little bit, if one of your, if you have some internal bleeding, you have no idea you're losing everything right now. So it's very hard to dose and very hard to like refine this gene specifically too as a drug and send it in. Okay, so a real plasmid looks something like this. Now, the reason it's in blue is because you don't need to know all these little sites. But what you're often going to have is a few things. And I will, I'll note these in red because it'll help you. I'm not going to strictly ask you to like know each thing because you can just always look these up. But here is AMP R. That is AB resistance, ampicillin being an, an antibiotic. This one has two selection markers. Here's that GFP. It's going to light up green and it's going to survive ampicillin. So it's got like two mechanisms to select for only the bacteria that got this plasmid when you gave it to them. Equally. Ori is usually meant to say this is the origin. And plasmids come with very attractive and aggressive gene expression sequences. So what that means is the gene that you put in a plasmid 
will be turned on to like thousands of copies, tons synthetically. Because some sequences of DNA are very more like, they're like, yeah, whatever's next to me, make tons of it to the bacteria. And we engineer that to make sure that's what's happening here. All these little sites that you see right here, these are all restrict, different restriction enzymes. They all have different targets of DNA that they chop, cut, things like that. So although there's a lot of these, this gives us a lot of options of where to insert and what to insert, right? Not too bad. Anything on the exam will probably be a little closer to saying for me, for example, hey, if I want to insert before this GFP sequence, what are two restriction enzymes I should target to do that insertion? Well, maybe we'll do this one right here and this one right here, right? Because we're going to cut right here, cut right here. And my gene sequence can now fit right in here if it's chopped on both sides too. So it really is sort of like kind of playing Legos a little bit with this. I don't want to oversimplify something really cool, but that's how plasmids can actually kind of work for us, become little factories. And in that case, this isn't, um, we will have like a writing way, way, way in the future, a little bit more about what possibly can you make. Some people kind of regard bacteria as sort of engines. We do have engines for certain drugs, certain things that certain people can't produce because of their genetics or because of a condition. But their genes, for certain archaeophile or archaeas, bacteria, they're things that eat plastic, for example, right? They're things that glow in the dark. They're things that we could send in to kill certain diseases. There's genes that we could kind of augment with all kinds of stuff. So I just want you to kind of think about this for the future. What's something that we could solve by making a lot of something genetically? Think about agriculture, think about, you know, hell, think about species that are nearly extinct. But if you give them the right boost against certain diseases, they can maybe make it. This is a very big amphibians thing too. A lot of fungi infect amphibians right now. And as the world warms a little more, they're getting spread out of where they can actually exist because the fungi can keep up with the climate faster than animals can. So key piece here too. Once the plasmid's in there, it's its own little free agent too. It will replicate with the bacteria, but it can also just do it on its own. This is in red. You do not need to know all the little details here. I just want you to see that picture and show that, hey, it's a circle of DNA. It starts replication just like we saw last class, and it just finishes. There's no telomerase. There's no inefficiency here. And it's very important to note that it can do this without the bacteria replicating too. So a single cell bacteria may start with one plasmid and it may end up with 16 in four hours. They do not depend, <clears throat> they do not depend strictly on the bacteria like host really growing. And all these rules are all just the same that we've learned with replication. Five to three prime, nucleotides, polymerase, whole thing. Cool. Should resize this. So equally, this is kind of a fun story that when we get into when we get into the final third of the class, we will be introduced to one of the characters that. They are the only things in genetics that can kind of self-replicate themselves. Plasmids are very much a bacterial thing, but their ancestry and their origins lies in the thing that can replicate itself. Viruses are that thing. Plasmids are likely long, long ago, like billions of years ago, they used to be viruses. Some of them came into bacteria cells and had some genes that were helpful and they were allowed to stay or then they didn't kill anything. Because everything we saw up here, most of the genes on a single plasmid, they're going to say, they're going to be there to say like, these genes are meant to polymerize us and stuff. They make their own polymerases. They make their own DNA stuff usually. So 
Okay. Last little bit. There's always a there's always typically an exam question that says bacteria in their own single cell do not cross over with their own genes. Remember how eukaryotes, we have a mom and a dad copy, we can cross over variation, right? In a single bacteria cell, you cannot do that. It is impossible. Make sure you know that. But I have to tell you the technical way that if two species are together, they can do that. But only when it's two independent organisms. Okay. Because the other fun thing about bacteria is that they're technically haploid, right? They only have one end genome. They only have one genome. Keep that in mind too. But slide you're looking at is if you manage to co-culture bacteria that are just close enough related to each other, but different enough to actually have to interact to survive, we can like induce this on a, on a proper medium. You can sometimes make a hybrid. But this is the rare case, but it's what I have to show you so that you can say like, there's one possible way for this, but the golden rule here is that they cannot recombine with themselves the same way eukaryotes do. That's a key difference and that's just easy points on the exam because I want you to know that. So this is only gonna happen between close enough species and only gonna happen if you force them to survive. Because what's happening here is, see down here, this offspring, it's got all those little pluses. That's the only offspring that can survive making all these things to survive on this plate that we've engineered to not have any of those things. So this slide's also a good example of what to go back and kind of see if you're comfortable with things. Does this make sense? It's a unique situation, and I always sort of hesitate to bring it up, but I feel like it's good learning. You basically start with two parents that can't survive, and only in this situation can they hybridize to make just one offspring that can survive. And without that survival question, they won't usually do it. Okay. Now, <laughs> don't get too mad at me. This is the final, this is sort of the finale of, do you understand plasmids and do you understand how circular DNA is going to work? And there's a practice question on this. Okay. So let's say on a plasmid, what you have right here is a cell to begin with that does not have any antibiotic resistance genes. You have a donor cell that does have a plasmid for all the donor genes. You will shatter up this cell using just enzymes to break up the DNA and see how you have, some of them are going to be independent, but some are going to actually be taken up together, right? See this B and this A right here? See how close they are? So, More often in this case, you will have a higher number of colonies surviving the plate that has two antibiotics, for example, the antibiotic A and the antibiotic B, if they are closer together on the plasmid, right? So when you shatter this thing, A and B are often gonna be found together because they're close. That means that there's gonna be more A and B surviving colonies when you dual up the antibiotics on the plate. And this is a way to sort of show and infer genetic distance on a plasmid. It also kind of forces you to reconcile the difference between linear eukaryotic linkage and plasmid linkage. So the more combo, so go, there's a practice problem on this one. Give it a shot on there, on the stats and guide when you get the chance. 
because the more co-transforms, what that means is that how many of the close two antibiotic genes came together, because if it's a high number, they're really close. And so what I mean by this is if I'm going to shatter this plasmid up, and I'm going to like break it in all these random spots, right? You are more likely to see things come together in a single unit if they are close. You are more likely to see things come alone if they are far away from each other, and you can start to infer where everything is. So here's me laughing as everything burns down, and this is pre-spring break, and you guys are sad because it's another linkage problem. But hopefully, we'll be okay. See, this is just like the theater scene that, that's refaced on. Terrible. Okay. So this is a fun little problem solved, and it does, it's kind of the finale of how plasmids work and how they're different from the others. Last piece of genomic exchange, we talked about this. Viruses can just give their DNA across things. Viruses are harder to control and harder to culture, so this isn't usually our favorite way to do stuff. We use that word transduction in there. This is sort of our little intro to viruses just through bacteria. Viruses will often splice their DNA into their host. So what HIV does to us, bacteria and bacterial viruses do the same sort of relationship sometimes. And as you can tell, it's quite a permanent fix in this case. Viral DNA will become part of the host DNA. Now, the next two behaviors are a little bit more about viruses and they will, they'll, they'll sort of rear their heads in the final section of the class a little more. It's still good to have this idea. Viral DNA, including the viral DNA from like ancient viruses in our genome, it replicates itself and behaves independently. You don't need to know all these steps, just see how the viral DNA will like clip itself, copy itself and make more. Bacteria have this happen all the time. Viruses basically bounce around the genome. We have this happen quite a bit as well. A large portion of our genome is just harmless, but copy pasting viruses. Because the only genes that these little sections code for is the gene to cut and then the gene to paste sometimes, that's it. The image and the text, it's pretty busy, but at the same time, all you need to know is that red text, is that the viral DNA is going to sort of replicate and copy paste itself all over the place. Last little bit about viruses, is that viruses can cross over with themselves when they encounter a neighbor. What I'll sort of leave you with on viruses is so remember one thing with genetics is that you do get to see sort of laws of nature and how they evolved at the basic level. When I showed you guys crossing over, it's exchanging pieces of DNA, and cutting and pasting, right? Realistically. All the variation that eukaryotic cells owe in that recombination, that crossing over, it's all inherently viral. So this could be green text of all things too. 
all of our crossing over machinery, everything. It's likely an ancestral sort of viral form that invaded a eukaryotic cell and started granting it some sort of power, some sort of variation. So it's an interesting relationship that life and viruses have had, given that most aspects of life have sort of a viral origin a lot of, in a lot of cases. So pretty sweet, sort of a sort of a sprint, but it's okay. Okay, take a break and then we'll kind of do the final section of the class. And this final section will kind of be like uh, Tuesdays where it's like, this is a very good application of what you just learned and why it's cool and important and less transforming bacterial linkage, hooray, sorry. Thanks, Michaela. Okay, so um, you will see some red text in this section, but don't don't let it bother you. I'm not going to test you on it. Um, who has heard of the microbiome before? Yeah, it's getting popular. So always ask this question before this section. What percent human do you actually think you are, right? It's kind of a weird one. Humans are made of 10 trillion cells. It's a lot. you're home to a hell of a lot more bacteria cells. Lots. Now, how's that possible? I don't look like a blob, right? It's because they're so much smaller than a eukaryotic cell, remember? So in the space of a single intestinal cell, you may have like 100 bacteria attached to it. In the tip of your finger, there's more bacteria than, live, than people that live in the entire United Kingdom. That's how many bacteria can actually exist in that such a small space. There are fungi, viruses, and archaea even that do exist in your body as well. So it's a very cool look into genetics and evolution, kind of sort of in an ecology evolution way, but it also has a lot to do with how medicine is sort of evolving in this direction too. So microbiome project, the reason this is so new is because think about the environment of your stomach. This is the main microbiome area. It is acidic, dark, no oxygen, 
super scary place, basically. Only until recently we were able to actually culture and like study these things in lab. And we've always sort of felt like there were missing pieces to why the genome doesn't tell the whole story, right? And other factors can be a little, they can explain more about humans than we'd like to admit sometimes. Some of these we talked about with structural events, things like that, but that can be a little bigger. So as far as bacteria inside of us go, we have quite a bit of different um, examples of how this can help. Now, in our gut, bacteria live and exist in a safe space that they've kind of evolved to be in. They're protected from all kinds of stuff. Equally, a lot of the stuff in our gut digests stuff that we can't eat. So that's mutualism up in the upper left. We have some bacteria that are commensal where the cow doesn't benefit here, but the little egret, it's gonna get all the bugs that are bouncing up from the cow eating. And obviously bacteria do still cause disease. There are some microbiome species that if they get out of control, they will have that negative effect on you. <laughs> Immensalism isn't, uh, isn't really at work here. I just like this example where the grass just gets trodden and eaten by the buffalo and the buffalo don't care. I just think that's funny. Poor grass, sorry. This is more like what we've got going on. We've got a symbiotic relationship, kind of like I said. They have their own genetics, though. They're, it's a very diverse collection of different organisms. Yeah, I mean, you get, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to take notes. You can take notes on this. We're not strictly testing it on the next exam, um, but it'll kind of give you a leg up for this, the little, some of the writings and stuff, give you ideas and such. Now, perfect way that they actually help us out is that if your gut is fully lined up with bacteria and you, you know, ingest something or sniff something up and it's a bacteria and it goes into your gut, there's nowhere for, for it to land. Your bacteria are basically like, hell no, this is my home, get out. And they actually kill things that come in because they are a living organism. They're trying to survive. They don't want an invading pathogen to show up. So that's why too, as well, Every, who's ever had antibiotics? Well, you don't have to raise your hand. It's kind of embarrassing, but who's ever had antibiotics and you feel not so great? Yeah, everybody, everybody's had that reaction. If you have antibiotics too often, you kill off a lot of your good guys. And the minute you stop, that lining is sort of vulnerable at that point. And you can actually have invasive species take over sort of like you are the environment in this case, it's sort of an odd thing. Now, the microbiome of a human is wildly different than that of a bonobo. The microbiome of a dog is wildly different than the microbiome of a cat. Typically, there are specific species that exist within their host species, that they have evolved over millions of years alongside them, within them. Now, you might be wondering, how do you transfer bacteria from, let's say, a mom to a newborn. And all I'm going to tell you, for those of you going into medicine, you will have an OBGYN rotation, and you will see that things get quite messy and lots of fluid. And some of that fluid transfers to the baby, and that's that. That's that. Yeah, medicine's not for me, man. No way. So you're a superorganism. Hooray, look at all these little things that can happen. It is ecology inside you, and that's kind of the cool part with all this. They'll hunt, they'll cooperate, they'll save you from stuff. Pretty good deal. Equally, this is one of my favorite stories. B12 is something that we need, something that our mammal brain needs more than any other mammal brain does. We can't produce it, sadly. There's a bacteria that can. Think about how many millions of years it would have taken to quote unquote even evolve a B12 gene, but instead we sort of outsourced it. Suddenly somebody had a bacteria in their microbiome that was pumping B12 and they had some sort of advantage. And their neighbors had that advantage too, because here's the other fun thing about microbiome stuff. The people you live with consistently typically will share that same sort of community because you are living in the same place, right? I'm not saying everybody's you know, using the bathroom at the same time. But typically, you're still going to have a sort of shared environment in this sense. 
this word outsource and the fact that a lot of who we are comes from the little species inside us, it's kind of interesting to remember that the whole the genome, the blueprint, the eugenics reply that you just gave, it's not always in the blueprint. There are other ways around genes. Another example, started to domesticate cows, poor things, started to eat them. As we ate the cows and poorly cooked the meat, sometimes bacteria would show up. I'm not saying do this, but the bacteria inside the cow microbiome is very good at chewing up cellulose. We are not very good at that. So as we started to eat cows, humans naturally started to incorporate more of those bacteria and those bacteria gave us an advantage. We started to be able to eat plants quite a bit easier. The same thing happened in domesticated dogs. Dog food is not pure meat, for example. Dogs have evolved for all the years with us to eat our trash, much of which is plants. Their microbiome does a lot of that work for them. Remember how I said, Scout's genome very close to a wolf genome? Her microbiome is not close to a wolf's. It's much better at digesting cellulose thanks to the partner species it has. So this is also similar to the fact that a mitochondria once barged into a eukaryotic cell and started making energy for it. And the memes began. Stupid powerhouse of the cell. It's very important, though. Okay. Who's ever seen this movie? Super Size Me. The McDonald's guy? He felt terrible at the end. And it wasn't just physically terrible. Mentally, he felt just drained and like he wanted to just give up on this thing. It's because you're kind of directing the evolution of what species are allowed to live. If you eat a lot of fiber, a lot of fibrous species will take hold and like they'll be the ones that dominate the environment. If you eat a lot of McDonald's, a lot of ones that are good at eating lipids and sugars, they will start dominating your area, like basically your whole lining. They'll have the advantage now. They'll actually start kicking out other bacteria that are unlike them if they gain the numerical advantage. Because remember, these things are alive and competing with each other. Typically, a better diversity in your gut microbiome. So here's a bunch of individuals right here. There's some random species up there. If you undiversify this number, you start to lose genetic advantages piece by piece, each species that you kill off. This is the beginning of why overuse of antibiotics is finally starting to make a trend towards, whoa, we can't kill everything. These things are nukes. They kill too many of the good ones. Yeah, you don't need to know that, I'm sorry. Well, no, come on. Young Tao will be mad at me if I don't talk about this. So bacteria, how we determine this species stuff, their ribosomes are very unique to ours. They have a specific ribosome RNA gene, and that's typically we just sequence a little bit to say which species is this. That's all it takes usually. So we're still working on this, but the gut is not your only place of microbiome species. There's microbes all over your skin. There's ones, you know, all, all over the place, basically. They each have different niches environmentally. In a lot of cases, they're, remember, they're trying to keep you alive too, a lot of the good ones, because they depend on you. Now, fun one. Who's ever seen Cordyceps fungus or play The Last of Us, right? Yeah, nasty. What happens with Cordyceps with the bugs is that it fries up their brain and it causes them to go towards light, which takes them up, and then they get eaten by something. They get eaten by like a bird, bird poops out more fungus. Cycle of life, right? Oh, no break time, sorry. We're almost done, I promise. So with humans, if you could take a pill and you would suddenly be more impulsive, would you do it? Yeah, some of you are saying no, I'd say no, hell no. Are you kidding me? What you're looking at is something called toxoplasmosis. It actually has its origins in mice or its typical host. What toxoplasmosis does is it sends out a toxin that looks very much like the GABA neurotransmitter. Or it, uh, sorry, it blocks the GABA neurotransmitter. GABA is the calm neurotransmitter. So if you block that, you suddenly become more risk-taking. And what this toxin does is causes a mammal brain to ignore fear signals a little easier. So in mice, what this means is the mouse with tox will go out and it'll go out of its hole and it'll just sit there 
and it's going out and eating, cat eats it, poops out the fungus. Mice eat the poop, cycle repeats. Mice are gross. So it's always a fun little thing to see that humans are not quite immune to this either. Tox produces the same effect in humans as far as we can tell. Human brains, like I said, different than mouse brains. But the observation did find that there was sort of a more risk-taking venture towards the people that were infected with this. So given that, it's also kind of interesting and it kind of makes sense and we kind of know this at this point. When you feed a gut microbe that likes sugar and it eats sugar, it doesn't eat fats, it doesn't eat fiber, it doesn't eat proteins, let's say. It's one of those species. When you eat the sugar, you get that kind of feeling where it's like, yes, this feels great, hooray. Some of that is the bacteria in your gut that are now feeding on what you just gave them. They're like, they will send up signals that mimic happy neurotransmitters. And they'll say, you're doing a great job, do it again. And they're manipulating you a little bit. They're trying to survive. So it's kind of an interesting thing. And it's the science where this is going is very interesting. Equally, a case study. One thing to remember about autism. There were so few cases of what this was called in 1900 that we didn't have a name for it. By 1950, we still didn't have many cases. We're getting better at diagnosis, so that might be the rise. But the relationship microbes have with the brain is unique and still being explored. So the rise over the 1950s has been that we eat more processed foods, we eat all this, we treat more often with certain chemicals, things like that. I'm not going all, you know, go eat poop or something, but it's definitely, it's definitely worth going through here. So this kid has an ear infection. Doctor's like, ah, antibiotics, doesn't work. Do it again, doesn't work. Do it again, do it again, do it again. Eight rounds, different antibiotics. Remember that diverse microbiome? That's gone, that's nuked. What comes in when you shred and you burn a field is a bunch of weeds at first, right? Weeds move in. Clostridiums are those one of those weeds. Clostridiums happen to produce something called propionate. It kind of disturbs the brain a little bit. And it also strangely causes a craving for wheat and bread. Because that's what they eat in a lot of cases, these clostridiums. This, is, this isn't linked, but I should show this. But um, we don't have a cause for autism. We don't know it quite yet. We know the genes associated with are immune genes, strangely, strangely. And it's the link between the microbiome and the immune system. Because remember, they're bacteria. Our immune system is supposed to kill bacteria, right? But the bacteria we're good with, they have defenses against it. But when you sort of overwhelm the system with a single, single one, it can cause all kinds of inflammation, nervous system issues, things like that. So we're trying to figure out unknown stuff through some different means these days. And this is one of those ways. Okay. I think that's where we'll go ahead and end since that's enough like interesting stuff. I'll maybe post these for fun, but they'll be all green text. But it's a good time. Okay.